Um, before I start, I have to do something very British. I have to um, apologize for something that's not in my hands. So I have a little bit of a flu, so just um, apologize, apologizing for it from now. <clears throat> the burqa. One of the first things that um, people notice about me um, is always the burqa, which is the cloak and um, the scarf. A lot of people tend to sometimes also find the face cover in it, but then in the context that I'll be speaking in, this is what I refer to as the burqa. And I'm sure that many of you as well, as I entered the stage or when I, if I met you outside, it is the first thing that strikes you. I think that if we all had a penny for each time that we stereotyped someone or that someone else stereotyped us, um, we would probably be ridiculously rich by now. So it was about, um, it's been 13 years since I started wearing the burqa. I was actually asked by my family to wear it. Um, and how old was I? I was about 17 then. And it was mainly cultural reasons. My mom wears it, my grandmother wears it, and, and so on. I struggled to actually identify myself in it at the time. I thought, you know, I was a teen. I was like anybody else at that age. I was loud, I was fearless, and I was very moody. And so I thought, you know, this expects me to, this, this burqa expects me to conform to how other people want me to behave. But shortly after 9-11 happened, and I started noticing that a lot of people looked at me very differently and suddenly started treating me very differently. And I wasn't sure why. I wasn't sure why was this happening. And so I could have done one of two things. The first one was to take it off and throw it away and pretend I never wore it. And the second one was, okay, let's continue wearing it and see how differently do people behave with me and what kind of really massive tragedy happens to me because I'm wearing it. So being stubborn that I was, and I guess I still am, um, I continued wearing it. But to know of my journey, you should know a little bit more context into my life. So I'm also a TEDx organizer. Uh, my event is TEDx Shekhawati which is um, a rural TEDx event that happens in um, Rajasthan, in India. It was quite a struggle to organize uh, this TEDx event because there were a lot of men and I had to fight them because they said that women don't deserve an education and that bringing ideas of social change was an unnecessary revolution. But despite that, I went on to organize the event, and now TEDx Shekhawati has become one of the largest, or maybe the largest TEDx event globally, with more than 5,000 villagers and small town people who attend this event. So on the side, I also campaign for girls' right to education in Rajasthan as well. And, you know, Muslims are a minority in India, and... Um, as that, as a Muslim in India, there's always the burqa has a different burden to bear of sorts. So when I go there, I get told that um, only the illiterate and the poor people wear it. So take it off, you know, like it's an embarrassment to walk next to you. Um, but obviously, I don't listen to that. I still wear it over there as well. And uh, when I think about the burqa and when I think of all of that, and I find it so interesting because when I am in villages, it is also the first thing that people notice over there as well, except the context is very different. So when I speak to girls and I speak to their parents and so on, and you know, the first question is, you wear a burqa in London also? And, um, and I say, yes, I do. And to them, it's a very inspiring thing, because to them, it's a reassurance that you can be a global citizen, but you can still hold on to your cultural values, and I guess for some people, religious as well. Because one of the things that many people don't realize is there's a fear for education in these rural communities because they think that education paints us all with one brush and that means that you give up on your cultural values to be one of everybody else. Um, and I don't mean this incident that I'll tell you now as a pat on the back or a bashful statement, but um, I think it was a very powerful moment for me when uh, during my previous TEDx events, there was a woman who came to me and said, uh, you know, after watching one of your campaign talks in your previous TEDx event, I have enrolled five of my daughters um, in a school. And so I find myself in the middle of that side of the burqa story, and I guess uh, the more international um, side of demonizing the burqa as well. 
But I think that you know, now the, the, the debate or the conversation of the burqa and around it has moved on from the ill-informed and biased talk of it being oppressive to it being a question of identity. What is happening is that a fear has been drilled into us, and we are all spreading and mutating this fear and this paranoia. One person's fear is another person's fear of another kind. For example, one person's fear of the burqa becoming popular and wanting to ban it is someone else's fear of losing something that's very important to them and holding on to it even tighter. For me, the burqa was not the magic. Uh, it was something that did make my life difficult, but not because it oppressed me um, or stopped me from doing something that I wanted to do. It was because of other people's perception towards it. It's been 13 years, but till now, I'll get sidelined in parties, in job interviews, on the public transport, and, and many other places. But the two things that I've learned, first one, I've learned not to get hurt easily and not to get offended easily. And the second thing is, it has given me this space in which I am free from outwardly judgment of other people. And that has helped me in becoming a much stronger person. The question is, so why or when or how did the burqa become something so oppressive? And this is my take on it. I think what happened was after 9-11, the burqa became something that was an integral part of what people saw as an Islamic identity. And Islam became the, um, you know, the unwanted hero of the limelight. And it was very easy to demonize a symbol versus an ideology. And so overnight, the burqa became the villain, uh, became a symbol of everything that was wrong in a society. One of the things we need to actually be scared of or be conscious of is the media. Uh, the media can really play with us. And uh, I'll give you an example. For example, if the if media comes up and says, uh, you know what, XYZ bombers, whoever, uh, was wearing the gray hoodie. And so the next time, you know, you're on the school run and you're getting your groceries, you're going to say, shit, that guy's wearing a gray hoodie. And you start noticing that person, like, he's wearing a gray hoodie, where's he going? And soon, you're going to keep thinking along those lines. And um, when you're sitting in a room and someone wearing a gray hoodie enters and you're like, oh boy, just keep watching that person. Why is this person wearing a gray hoodie? And why is this person in this room with us? What is he going to do? And then it's going to encroach on your sanity. So what you really want to do is get this damn gray hoodie banned because there must be something terrible about it. But the thing we don't understand is that the gray hoodie or the burqa doesn't make someone a negative person, a bad person, a terrorist, or does not oppress anybody. It's the people who do that. So if you use the burqa as a tool to measure and manage oppression, it's really the wrong thing. Because if somebody, if a guy or even women do that, if they force you to wear a burqa, they also force you to do a lot of things that you don't want to do and not allow you to do a lot of things that you want to do. So that is not enough in really giving you a picture on whether this person is oppressed or not. I was um, initially slightly hesitant in giving this talk because, you know, I said, um, I don't want to appear to be um, a custodian or some kind of an ambassador um, of a burqa. But it's largely because I feel that religion, and more importantly, choice, is such a personal thing that it is really nobody's business to dissect someone else's life. There are days when I struggle to express myself because, uh, you know, who am I? and people would like to define you in um, you know, the parameters of uh, stereotypes, whether it's a gender or religious or your background. Uh, but I don't conform personally to any of those. So when I can't answer that to myself, um, it becomes very difficult to try to explain it to other people. And, um, and I think the toughest thing actually is to make them then believe um, in what you're saying. Because, you know, um, when I have some of these conversations about the burqa and hijab niqab, um, you know, I've, um, I've been told, you know, you are oppressed, you just don't know it yet. <laughs> and, and then, what do you say to that? 
And I feel that, you know, um, whether the burqa exists or not, and whether it's black or it's pink, um, we're forgetting to note that there is a human being in it. And that if we stop looking at these clothes, and if we really um, want to set ourselves free from the oppression of stereotypes, we need to start looking at a human being from a much different perspective. And, you know, thank God for the internet. Um, my idea worth spreading um, was this one. Thank you so much.